Welcome to Municipal Affairs, the show dedicated to delving deep into the matters that shape municipalities from across Canada. Now, today we embark on a critical juncture in the provincial landscape of Alberta, the Alberta speech from the throne, which has laid out a framework, a rallying cry, if you will, for the province's sovereignty, a promise of economic prosperity and an unwavering dedication to the well-being of our communities. In the speech, the Lieutenant Governor laid out the vision of the government. It boldly outlined the employment of motions under the Sovereignty Within the United Canada Act, underscoring the government's unwavering commitment to safeguarding the provincial constitutional prerogatives against any undue encroachment. Furthermore, as Alberta's population burgeons, the province is met with the pressing need to fortify its infrastructure to construct roads, schools, and other vital facilities that will not only support, but propel Alberta's communities towards a prosperous and sustainable future. Honorable members, as our province grows by another million people, over the next five years and to 10 million by 2050. So too must investment in our municipalities and provincial transportation network. Aside from healthcare facilities, schools and other needed building infrastructure, the province needs to substantially invest in infrastructure that incentivizes economic development, attracts skilled professionals, and increases the quality of life of Albertans. That is why Alberta's government has been working closely with municipalities across Alberta to finalize a new funding framework that is tied to provincial revenues and provides more predictability for capital planning at the municipal level. But the province also needs to significantly expand our provincial transportation and high highway network and build commuter rail links between our two largest cities and their growing neighboring communities and airports. We need to decongest our highways to Kananaskis and Banff with a passenger rail tie between the Calgary Airport, downtown Calgary, and Canmore Banff. And yes, we need to start planning for the inevitable need for high speed rail through the Calgary Red Deer. Edmonton Corridor when six to seven million Albertans eventually call that corridor home. These investments are decades long and should not be made randomly. They must be planned carefully and in an integrated fashion to ensure the most efficient and timely use of tax dollars. Alberta's government intends to do just that. The realm of public safety is not overlooked in the speech, as reforms to the justice system and increased police force are envisioned to fortify the protection of our neighborhoods. Equally imperative is the establishment of recovery communities and intervention programs for those grappling with the weight of addiction and mental health challenges, underscoring a commitment to the holistic well-being of all Albertans. Housing was a key focus in the speech, with the government planning to tackle the issue related to more housing. Honourable members, housing and the price of housing has become one of the greatest concerns across the country. Albertans feel these pressures and Alberta's government is here to support them. The government is expanding the use of rent supplements to better use existing rental market capacity and help more Albertans get into suitable affordable housing. 
Alberta's government is also working to develop partnerships and build capacity within the housing system to support an additional 12,000 low-income households through rent assistance. With its partners, Alberta is now supporting $9 billion in housing investments to build 25,000 new units by 2031 and will be working with municipalities to drastically increase private construction to ensure Albertans can find homes to rent and buy that fit within their budgets. In response to the speech from the throne, Alberta municipalities released a member's update emphasizing the critical need for substantial investments in infrastructure that incentivizes economic development, reflecting the shared vision of progress and prosperity for all. Quote, while short on details, the high-level speech identified government priorities, the needs for massive infrastructure improvements, and the need to substantially invest in infrastructure that incentivizes economic development, end quote. Earlier this week, we chatted with Rural Municipalities of Alberta President and Pinocchio County Reeve, Paul McLaughlin, who graciously shared his insights on the speech from the throne and his hopes for the forthcoming legislative session. President McLaughlin, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. I, I want to start with a general reaction from RMA, Rural Municipalities of Alberta, with regards to the speech from the throne. The Alberta government is back after the provincial election. Was the speech what you expected or could they do more? No, definitely. I think that, uh, you know, the core message right now is affordability. I think that's part of the discussions that everybody's having, uh, affordability and housing. I, you know, you can't deny that those are two issues that uh, are, are kitchen table discussions. Um, uh, my kids have just moved out and, and they've sent me texts saying, holy cow, groceries are expensive, dad. However, do we do it? Uh, so pretty real. And, and I think that uh, the speech from the throne touched those pieces. And I think uh, it's interesting timing because uh, when the speech from the throne comes out and not too, uh, not too long before that, we've got some interesting uh, uh, changes in carbon tax as it relates to heating oil out east. So, uh, you know, we need to tell our story. And I think uh, we are, are unique from our power generation standpoint. Affordability is different. At the same time, Albertans always punch above their weight. So uh, hopefully the speech from the throne will resonate in Ottawa as much as it will in uh, rural Alberta. So I'm going to talk about the carbon tax in a few minutes, if you don't mind, but I want to stick to the speech from the throne. Uh, during the uh, election period, you came out, uh, you as in the royal you, as the rural municipalities of Alberta came out with their uniquely rural campaign, uh, outlining key priorities that you want this government, uh, the next government at the time, this current government, to focus on healthcare being a priority, crime being a priority, infrastructure being a priority, while they were talked about. Uh, it didn't seem there was much details on what this session holds for these items. Uh, are you anticipating meeting with the premier? I know you have your upcoming convention, meeting with the premier, meeting with the minister to sort of advocate for more uh, concrete uh, action items on these particular files. Yeah, and, and I think that uh, for the most part, I think that our uniquely rural, I mean, our campaign was really based upon uh, telling our rural story, making sure that it was understood. And I really actually looked at the mandate letters as actually a direct reflection on our program. Uh, quite a few components that were part of the mandate letters of the various ministers really resonated. In fact, uh, very close to verbatim, some of the core questions we have, whether it's health care uh, or crime or uh, most of those other pieces. So um, I do know that this session's got uh, seven to nine items. Uh, we'll We'll learn as we go. Uh, do I feel I'm being heard by this government? I, I would say 100%. We actually, this government is is very been very, very responsive to uh, to rural Albertans. Uh, I've even said to my members, I said, we're probably uh, probably at a point now that we've probably had more resonance with, with a, a sitting government than we've had in the past. And I mean, that's recognized in the voting patterns, but at the same time, a lot of what we're hearing in mandate letters, if I was... If I was playing rural bingo, which I do because I'm the president of rural municipalities of Alberta, 
uh, rural ended up in, in mandate letters more than I've ever seen. Uh, this government echoes a lot of the rural issues and, and, and actually reflects quite well on them. So, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm pleasantly impressed by so far the, the voice that we're getting and the response of the government uh, to date. Now, I had the pleasure to sit down with Rick McIver last week regarding uh, this upcoming session, and I asked him point blank about LGFF and MSI and uh, if uh, they were potentially, municipalities going to be potentially getting some more money, uh, and he kind of scoffed it off by saying uh, municipalities always ask for more money. Ten years ago, it was the same question. Ten years from now, it will be the same issue. Um, this this uh, throne speech did outline that there is a new formula, but that's about it, that the municipality these are going to be going to LGFF. I know that RMA and Alberta municipalities are still working through the formula process, but are you still going to be calling on the federal, uh, the provincial government to actually increase the LGFF because municipalities like yours in Pinoca and across Alberta are struggling right now? We have to ask that. And I, you know, and I, I guess the, the twist on words is we're not actually asking for any new money. Uh, we want to be made whole again. Yeah. Uh, these were promises made by the Stelmac government. It's been recognized that a certain component of our taxes are, are taken up by by uh, school tax, uh, ASFF, uh, technically speaking, but school requisition. Uh, Stelmac recognized that, created a program which was MSI. Uh, and fast forward today, it, it should be, uh, we're being generous, saying it should be a billion dollars more. Actually, if you do the math, it should be close to $2.8 billion as transfers back. And that's not transfers, that's not creating new money for municipalities. That's giving us back the tax room that's been consumed by ASFF. So we want to be whole again. So it's not that we're actually asking for more money, we're asking for our money back. Um, and I and I think it's an, it, it's it sounds nuanced, but it is true. Uh, we are stepping backwards. Uh, we're going to continue to advocate for bridge funding, which is a core piece for us. Uh, water wastewater is a core piece for us. Um, I think that if we advocate for more spending specifically on bridge funding and that on water wastewater, which technically in many ways helps our uh, small towns, our rural remote communities. I think it's an important discussion. You know, there's a there's a small community in Alberta. I probably think I've told you this before, Chris, but I'll tell it again. Uh, they have 100 people and they have a $10 million wastewater uh, water uh, infrastructure deficit um, between 100 people. Uh, you know, modern wastewater facilities and modern water treatment facilities, they, they, they cost that much money. Um, we need to recognize that that's a burden on rural Albertans. Uh, with 15% of the population, 28% contribution to GDP, 44% capital investments in rural Alberta. We matter. Um, we create the energy. We actually uh, provide the water. We provide the food. And, and there needs to be flows back. Um, and you've heard this before from all of my colleagues at FCM, but we need to recognize that only 10 cents on the dollar or tax dollars available to municipalities, where we manage 60% of the infrastructure in the province of Alberta, 64% of the road infrastructure is managed by the good folks that I represent, which covers 85% of the land base. So our message has never changed. Uh, we do feed Alberta. We do provide the uh, contribution to GDP and uh, it's great investment. Rural municipalities is a phenomenal investment. You get to experience it every single day as you drive around Chris and visit my colleagues. Uh, those beautiful roads have to be paid somehow and, and this is the way to do it. I want to talk about transportation before we do turn to energy. And the one thing that came out of this uh, speech from the throne that I was kind of taken back, and it doesn't impact rural residents as much as uh, potentially it impacts the municipalities, and that is the high-speed uh, corridor between Calgary and Edmonton and Calgary and uh, Canmore and Banff. Now, this has been something that the government has been tossing around, but they've actually put it in a speech from the throne. It's potentially 10 years from now when it's going to be uh, done, but here we are. Are you happy with this? Is rural municipalities looking for a way to get people off the roads so that way it doesn't impact their roads so that their infrastructure is uh, they're looking after and getting people on uh, high speed trains to go between the two largest cities? Well, and and you know, I I, I think I, I'd say that the high speed train is a great idea, and I, and I know that there's conversations around um, you know uh, putting it in a vacuum tube and using some future tech. Um, we probably don't have the population to sustain that type of infrastructure purchase. Personally, I've been, I was in Eastern Europe uh, last 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 fall. 
uh, sorry, last spring. Um, I mean, you're dealing with population centers that far exceed anything that we have here in Alberta. Maybe projectively, probably in 20, 30 years, we likely be there. Uh, core investments on on two, uh, three landing highway two would be a better investment. Uh, core transportation uh, infrastructure would be an investment. Um, I think that money would be better spent on making a reading on highway two than it would be uh, a high speed rail. Um, I think it sounds good. Sounds kind of cool and techy. Um, uh, you know, I, I travel that road quite a bit. Uh, when it's when it's snowy, it's a tough road, and and uh, uh, when it's a busy long weekend, it's a tough road. And we just need to invest in that infrastructure. I think that that's a key thing. Um, you know, I've heard about it. I've been 15 years. I've been here about 15 years. I'll probably hear about it for the next 15 years. Sounds cool. Sounds fantastic. Not I, really I want well to, sold on it. I want to talk about the energy industry because this was a main focus for the speech from the throne, particularly diversification and getting to net zero and potentially moving from an electric grid that is uh, by 2030 to 2050. Um, this will impact your communities. This will impact your communities because there's not many places in urban centers where you can build power plants or new renewable energies. Um, are you confident that this government can work hand in hand with municipalities to build some of these projects with whether it be wind, solar, uh, new oil and gas uh, uh, mules? Are you confident that the rural municipalities will have a strong voice with this government when it comes to expanding and the future of the, econ uh, the energy industry? Well, and and I think that you know the uh, the 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 AUC review of, of renewables, I think echoed a hundred percent what my members have been saying is that they're supportive of the renewable industry, uh, but we need to make sure that we're making core land use decisions to deal with this hotter, drier future. Um, food security, um, and making sure that we're using the best land for that purpose I think is important. Uh, and then have a plan thereof. I, I'm confident this government recognizes what the problem is, and the problem is quite complex. We well, we have a situation where, uh, you know, we have less than 10% hydro available. Uh, our ability to generate even renewables is, is intermittent. We do have limitations, and we probably can get to 50% renewable. Um, can we get up beyond that? Uh, it gets it gets the laws of physics, and, and a nice, cool January, February make it quite complex. Um, I think the government's taking it very seriously. Uh, Minister Newdorf, I think, has uh, has really looked at the file. There is going to be some really uh, bold decisions need to be made, and it's how our the future of our grid. I think that zero conversation, uh, I think, will be met too as well. And it's it's all a question of timing. Um, I think it's uh, quite fascinating, uh, you know, by extension, and of course, it's it's all about timing. Uh, pulling off carbon tax on the oil out east. Um, is wrecking constraint on a fuel source and the government, uh, the federal government is making concessions thereof. They need to do the same for Alberta, recognizing that we do not have, uh, Ontario and, and Quebec are, are almost net zero just out of the gates uh, with the amount of hydro production they have and with nuclear. Um, we have we have to go on a path that is fits our place and time, what we have available to us, uh, natural gas is a tremendous fuel, and we have 300 million, sorry, 300 years of it, uh, trillions of cubic feet that could be used to, to power our future, and uh, and we need to we need to go down that path. Um, I think that the the government is definitely being uh, aggressive, but I think they need to be. I think that uh, a lot of the edicts that have come out of the federal government aren't matching uh, the situation that Saskatchewan and, and Alberta are, are in. And, uh, and that needs to be recognized. We, we have some geography issues. And the other th interesting thing is, is that we should never f uh, forget the territories. Uh, the Yukon and NWT, as well as Inuvialuit, they have the same issues that we have. Their ability to generate is very limited. And uh, so I think that uh, it's making it pretty real. And I'm glad at least we're having the discussion now, for sure. So you've reached the subject, so I want to play in the sandbox for a little bit here. As the president of the Rural Municipalities of Association, I'm assuming you just heard, uh, either you, I've either heard or, ha or have heard, that Prime Minister Trudeau came out today and said, there's going to be no more caveats. What happened in Atlantic Canada is going to stay in Atlantic Canada. So this means that Alberta and Saskatchewan and the North uh, and the territories are probably not going to be getting relief from the carbon tax. Uh, we there's snow on the ground here in Alberta already. It is cold. <laughs> it is really cold. And I'm even watching myself and I live in Calgary. 
what does this mean for your members and your members residents when uh, you see a federal government pitting one part of the country against another? Well, I, I mean, in many ways, I think it's uh, it's it's gone down the path of uh, cognitive dissonance. So uh, the, the federal government has not yet to meet a single one of their climate change goals. Uh, carbon tax is a market driven tool uh, that was provided, should provide some KPIs. Those KPIs have never been met. Um, to me, the, the signaling of actually providing relief of carbon tax off of heating oil on the East Coast, which can use heat pumps that are not very successful in the province of Alberta, um, you know, doesn't work very well past minus 20, which, you know, we live that dream here, lucky us, right? Um, and, and I think that what needs to happen is we need to reevaluate our approach to, to uh, carbon tax. I think it is a failed policy piece. I support it from an economic standpoint. It makes complete sense to me from an economic. It has it changed behavior. Does it change behavior on the necessities of life, which is heat? Um, from the members that I represent, we are large consumers of energy because we have to dry our grain. We have livestock to keep and we have pumps. I use more power than the average average Albertan and by extension, probably more than the average Canadian. Um, and that's just due to the operations that I have here. Um, I think uh, that's doubling down, I think, is was probably a, a poor choice by the by the for the prime minister. Um, my members are going to be truly upset. Um, and I think that uh, making that signal that this is just the one one caveat, I think that's political suicide from a policy standpoint. I think it's denigrated the whole role of carbon tax. It's actually done the opposite of what the goal would be for climate change goals. And uh, my members would be terribly disappointed by that gesture. And I had not heard that yet. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I've definitely been trying to be supportive of us having climate change conversations. And uh, when you have the, the more special and the, and the specialist um, with and, and calling it on geography uh, is terribly disappointing and, and disappointing to myself. Uh, my members are probably extremely upset. Uh, they're feeling that uh, that we are played off geographically, and my good friends on the on the east coast, uh, we work quite well at Federation Municipality uh, at the FCM level. Uh, wonderful people, and yeah, they needed help for sure. Um, they were backed into a corner. They're using a fuel source that's volatile, um, and uh, interestingly enough, they're not using a fuel source that's made in Canada. Uh, most of their fuel sources are coming from Venezuela and uh, the Middle East. So go figure. This government, the provincial government, Daniel Smith's government, has made electricity one of the key uh, sticking points for this throne speech as well. And I got to ask, because we are seeing the rise of uh, electricity prices across this province right now, is this impacting your members? And what are you calling on the uh, provincial government to do to sort of help rectify some of these uh, electric electricity issues that this government has sort of p- uh, boasted upon us? Well, I, you know, I've had, had the, the fortune of meeting with Mr. Newdorf, who, who this is his file, and there is the affordability minister, too, as well. Um, I, I think that they're taking it very seriously. I think the AUC review and some of the components thereof are going to find solutions to this. Uh, can we wait till till February? Uh, probably not. I think that the government is probably going to have to take some action soon, uh, whether it's reforms to withholding. Uh, other pieces in the system need to be corrected. Uh, renewables do provide a, a cheap form of, of power, and that needs to be recognized in the system. At the same time, the entire system needs to work as a whole. So um, I'm glad the government's doing have they this a party item? Um, I think that they got a lot of criticism for it, but I think at the back, and I think this government is committed uh, to finding solutions. Um, our market system uh, came with some great parts of it, and came with some 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 pieces of it that need to be fixed. And and uh, all in most cases, at the side of my lane, um, I think there's a tremendous opportunity here to actually future proof our electrical grid. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, people talk about the Alberta advantage. You go back way back in the day. Uh, in many ways, our best. Alberta was actually the uh, three cents a kilowatt coal power that we had at the time. Um, that provided us a lot of that power and, and energy uh, to allow us to the extractive industries. Uh, the oil and gas industry was supported by that. And uh, we're sort of dealing with the ramifications of not having that that cheaper base load. So my expectation is from what I've seen so far, uh, this government's about action. Uh, Minister Newdorf knows the file, uh, working with the premier. And uh, for everything that the premier, premier is saying and the discussions they're having, um, they understand the file. And I think they'll make the changes necessary to make this uh, uh, cheaper for Albertans. My members pay really high electrical bills <laughs> and, and they let us know it. Uh, it is very tough. 
uh, very tough. And and we have producers in Southern Alberta that are paying a hundred thousand uh, dollars a month utility bill uh, utility bills on irrigation pivots. Uh, just imagine paying a hundred thousand dollars a month, and then all of a sudden having the power prices that we're seeing right now. Pretty significant for sure. Um, I have one last question before I let you go here, and it's about uh, RMA convention next week. Uh, I, I know uh, we we're supposed to be talking about the Swedish throne, but I can't get, let you go without asking, what do you hope to accomplish over the four-day convention in Edmonton? And what are you hoping your members take away from this four-day convention in Edmonton? Well, I mean, we first of all, it's always an opportunity to, to you know, listen to ministers, have those discussions, dealing with those local issues. Um, my hope is, is that we'll have some 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 announcements that are tied to the housing file. I think that we do have some critical housing requests, uh, whether it be senior housing or affordable housing. Um, my expectation would be that we're having those core conversations around agriculture tied to really we've had uh, close to 20 now agricultural disasters declared in southern Alberta. We do have severe drought conditions still permeating throughout southern Alberta. We need to talk about those pieces. Um, and you know what? We can't deny that we came out of one of the worst fire seasons, if not the worst fire season in Alberta history. Uh, let's learn from it. Let's get ready for next year, uh, next go round, and let's hope it doesn't happen next year. But if it happens next year, uh, we should be we, we should be ready for it. So uh, my members always feel like they've been heard at these conferences. I think that the uh, the, the government enjoys them. They enjoy our members. Uh, you know, we don't uh, we don't pussyfoot around. They tell you what they think. And and uh, as president of RMA, they tell me what they think of me too. Trust me, I hear it. Um, and uh, I think it's just an important time that, and it's a good pulse check for the government. Uh, when you meet with the people that are the salt of the earth that I represent, they're all common sense. You, yeah, you, you, get to, you get to hear what's right and what's wrong. So I think there'll be lots of applause. There'll be uh, the odd grumbling. And at the same time, uh, I think you might get a couple standing ovations if the right things are said. So you did say something and I have to ask because I, I, we talked about it a few minutes ago with somebody else, but in this speech from the throne, there was no mention about the wildfire recovery and uh, the wildfire situation that would happen this year and potentially lead up to next year. Um, is this something on your radar that you hope this government tackles? Uh, yeah, I just met with uh, 10 of my members just about uh, an hour and 33 minutes ago to discuss that. Um, my members have uh, pretty good constructive uh, solutions to, to making things better. Uh, there, we did have some amazing work was done. We had some great responses. The government uh, provided the resources. Uh, it's just let's do it better. Learn from it. Make sure we correct it. Um, so this is this is our discussion for this year is going to be wildfire response and and also tied to that is going to be drought response in southern Alberta. Uh, we're dealing with a hotter, drier future. Uh, we need to put our pieces in place and, and find out how all levels of government to work to be more responsive. So um, if it's not in the speech from the throne, I, I, I'm not too worried about what's not in there. It, it, it's, lo it's long enough. You can't put it all in there. So um, my expectation is that uh, we'll, we'll hear what we need to hear and we'll have those discussions. And, and uh, Minister Lowen specifically with forestry definitely uh, has a great relationship with our members. So we'll find some good solutions and, and we'll, be, uh, we'll be better prepared for if this happens again, for sure. With the tabling of the speech from the throne, we also wanted to bring in our provincial affairs pundit, Jennifer Burgess, today to discuss the speech and what it means for Albertans, and more importantly, what it means for municipalities within Alberta. Jen, 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 long time no talk. We are back after almost, it seems like probably about five months since the last time you and I sat down for the show. Always a pleasure to sit down with you. Thank you so much. We want to talk about the speech from the throne that was tabled uh, on Monday by the Lieutenant Governor of Alberta. And I just want to start with a general question, because this is a round table and there's going to be a free exchange of ideas here. What did you take away from the speech from the throne, which opened up the 34th session of the, the first session of the 34th legislature of Alberta? Yeah, um, thanks for having me here, Chris. I'm always thrilled to be back on this amazing show. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was really curious to listen to the throne speech. I think like a lot of people, this has kind of been, you know, Premier Smith's first full mandate. It's quite a different tone than last year. You know, last year we were all wondering, is this going to be all about, you know, COVID vaccines? Like, what is she going to bring over from her leadership campaign? 
um, you know, I took from this throne speech, it's a very stay the road kind of speech. Um, I think a lot of people would describe it as underwhelming. And I think that was intentional. This isn't a speech that's, you know, meant to rile anyone up. It's not going to announce anything super brand new that we weren't expecting. Um, the throne speech really kind of like sets the tone and the message for a session. Um, and so I think this is a session that we're going to know what to expect. We're going to know what Premier Smith's priorities are. And um, she's not going to surprise us with anything. And what, what did you think was the tone? Because from my outset, from just listening to it, just because I, I I wasn't able to listen to it live, but listened to it afterwards, the tone that I got was, we're ready for a fight with Ottawa, and we're coming for you, Ottawa. And it, she kind of has put Justin Trudeau in the crosshairs here, to use that analogy, to say, okay, Alberta's here, and we're going to make sure that you understand that Alberta has its own rules and regulations, and you're going to stay out of those jurisdictional roles. Is that what you got? Yeah, I was very focused on Ottawa, for sure. I mean, it's you could have transplanted it and moved it into the Ottawa <laughs> parliamentary building, and it, it would have been an effective speech as well. So, you know, definitely the sort of like take it to the feds campaign is a big focus for Premier Smith. Um, really interesting to see the pension um, fight not mentioned as a part of it, though. That was quite interesting to I think a lot of people watching. Um, so I think she's really picking and choosing her battles. Um, she you know, is really riding on the, the climate discussion, the climate tax and legislation that works really well for her in her leadership campaign. So of course, she's going to keep pressing on that. Um, but you know, maybe the pension conversation is not going quite as well as she hoped. And maybe that's a different path she's taking. Well, it's interesting because I, I kind of looked at that as well because it's like, okay, are, is she going to mention the pension? Are they going to talk about the pension? Because it is kind of the, been the key focus for the Smith government over the last probably month and a half since they rolled it out in, I think it was about late August, beginning of September. Yeah. But since, and I'm, I'm going to put sort of a little caveat here, since Pierre Polyev, the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, came out and sort of was saying, I think Alberta should stay in the Alberta, uh, the Canada pension plan. The talk about it has kind of been sidelined and it doesn't seem like even this government is focused on it as much as it was, say, two months ago when uh, Justin Trudeau released his little letter to an open letter to Premier Smith saying, I'm going to do whatever I can to keep you in the Canadian pension plan. Is this just her realizing the writings on the wall and people are not? wanting it because i i don't i talk to people and i'm not sure what you're hearing from your people uh, uh, people in your circle but no one's talking about a alberta pension plan right now and no one's like saying i'm gonna vote against it or i'm gonna vote for it twitter is but the normal person on the side of the street i don't think is talking about it yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, talking about our friends and municipalities, I don't think it's high on their priority list. Um, but I, I do think, you know, Premier Smith has her eye on this for a reason, and she's very strategic. So I don't think we'll see it go away. I think she's provided herself with some cover with this idea of a referendum. She's not going to make any changes until she puts it to the public. So, you know, whatever the result of that referendum, she's got a bit of cover to just leave it or to move forward with it. So we'll probably see it push down the path a bit more. And maybe that's why it wasn't in the front speech. She's not quite ready to maybe make the hard push that she was expecting to right away. So you, you, you breached the subject. So I want to talk, I want to play in the sandbox for a little bit for uh, if you don't mind. And I want to talk about municipalities now about halfway through, I got to the point where I said to myself, okay, Edmonton and Calgary have been mentioned once in this throne speech so far. And that was about crime. And I was like, okay, usually by this time, they're talking about what they're going to do for rural municipalities, what their plans are for laying out for the uh, legislative session for each of our sort of larger projects, infrastructure projects. But it didn't come until probably about the 30, 35 minute mark where they actually talked about some municipal issues and they talked about municipal funding. And now I, I had the pleasure to sit down with Rick McIver last week and I asked him about this funding and he did say that, of course, municipalities want more money. Of course, municipalities want more money because that's what they're looking for, just like the provinces. But they have a new funding, which is uh, the local uh, local government fiscal framework, which is going to tie funding for municipalities to the oil and gas sector. So boom means up. Uh, slow growth means you're going to get less money. And that was it. At the end of the day, municipalities, I'm looking at this, I'm saying if I was a mayor or commu um, uh, uh, mayor of a town or a village or even the two big cities, I'm going, there's not much in here for me, is there? 
Yeah, and I mean, I do think that's that's pretty typical for throne speeches. You know, usually municipal policy isn't sort of the big tone setting, message setting things that you start the session with. To me, it so, is. <laughs> I know for us it is, but, um, you know, historically not always the case. So I think a lot of the more seasoned, you know, elected municipal representatives know that probably, you know, whatever that mysterious formula for the new LI, was it LGFF. LI, LGFF, thank you. The new LGFF is probably not going to be in there. That's not when they're going to pump it out. Um, but I think, you know, to your earlier point, they were definitely listening for infrastructure announcements is usually something that is in the throne speech, like, you know, great news for funding this train line. And there was mention of rail at the very end. I was really happy to hear um, that that I wasn't expecting that to be in this speech, but um, she does have a bit of a vision for that's going to work. So I'm sure municipalities were happy to hear about that, but just not a lot of specifics, you know, on this new sort of like approach to taxes and doing referendums about tax revenue like how is that going to affect municipalities and a lot of unanswered questions there well i want to talk about that rail line for a second because there was two rail mm -hmm. lines that they mentioned so they mentioned the one from calgary airport to the downtown area of calgary to banff or canmore and then they talked about one from calgary red deer to edmonton now the last uh provincial election this didn't really have that much of a conversation around it yes it was mentioned once or twice but in this throne speech, it is laid out. It is saying that this is something we're going to look at because we need to get people off roads, uh, particularly in that Kananaskis corridor from Calgary to Banff and get people onto high-speed rails. But the thing that I found interesting here, and this is the part where I was like, whoa, this is unusual for them to come out and say, we're looking at it, but it could be a decade from now where we actually do something about it. And that's where I took back and I went, okay. Why mention something that you're looking at 10 years from now instead of saying we've had the uh, the planning, we've had the uh, uh, in, uh, project leads come in and look at this option and we're going to do it. But it's no, it's we're coming 10 years from now for high speed rail, which to me is kind of far fetched. Yeah, managing expectations, I guess. <laughs> I mean, it does take a long time to build those infrastructure projects and those conversations have been going on forever, right? And it was probably as long as you and I have been following this kind of policy, those conversations have been happening. Um, so it's, you know, they're not quick to build, but, um, you know, good to see them in the throne speech. And at least I, I do think that was a bit of a, a throwaway to municipalities saying we recognize like you have some infrastructure needs. I, I agree. I just hopefully that they don't just forget about all the other communities around because yes, there's a lot of rural there's issues. There's other ones. <laughs> there certainly is. I, I want to talk about the tax policy because it seemed like this was the main focus for the majority of it. We we had the we're going to come for uh, the federal government. We're going to make sure that they stay in their fiscal lane. And then they really rolled out their bill one, which is basically saying there's going to be no tax hikes unless the people of Alberta want one. I forget the name of the, uh, the bill right now it's not coming to the top of my head this is red meat for her base is it not this is red meat for the uh conservative base that uh, the voter coalition that she got uh, cobbled together during the last election who brought her this majority mandate yeah i mean uh, no taxes was pretty much what used to be ran on the last election so it's not surprised to to see sort of a flagship policy there. Um, you know, I think a lot of unanswered questions, though, you know, if you you put a pause on tax hikes, that that has real big implications for revenue, um, you know, especially for municipalities, like just recently, Edmonton came out and said they have to raise property taxes. The city of Calgary is, you know, indicated they have this huge infrastructure gap. And if the province doesn't help them, they're going to have to raise taxes. So like raising taxes is part of the conversation. <laughs> so it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how they thread that needle. It's going to be, and uh, the um, uh, I, I'm blanking right now. The Minister of Finance, Nate Horner, that I, I was trying to remember what his name was. I was like, is it Doug Horner? No, that's his father. It changes Nate a Horner. lot. Exactly. <laughs> Nate Horner has a big, uh, has a pretty packed uh, agenda for the next few months for himself. He has this issue around uh, taxes. He has the APP, the Alberta Pension Plan. This is putting a lot of pressure on the finance minister to make sure that these things go about. Don't get me wrong, Rebecca Schultz and environment is also going to be busy with these regulations around uh, 2030 or 2050 about the energy uh, uh, regulators and uh, the grid. But it seems like there's a big focus on the financial prosperity of this province. Do you think that this is the best foot forward for the premier who traditionally, when you're a conservative, you do better on uh, economic issues rather than health care issues? 
Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, she, I guess, has a lot of confidence in that minister. I did notice that too, um, you know, especially I watched your your interview with Minister McIver earlier, and it doesn't seem like he has quite similar mandates. You know, he was talking about things like building codes and working with fire chiefs. <laughs> it's a, he's got quite a different portfolio he's working on there. So there's there's quite a bit of focus on, um, you know, changing that um, the financial treasury board dynamic. Um, but like to your point, it's a big mandate. It's a lot of work. Um, Jeez, yeah, I I hope he's up to it. <laughs> like I, I and I don't know uh, Nate. I don't, I don't know the Minister of Finance. Like I, everyone knew who Travis Taves was after four years because he was the Minister of Finance. But you didn't know him when he first got elected because he was newly elected. But Nate Horner has been around for almost six years now, for well, five years now because he was elected. He was Minister of Agriculture, and now he's the second, pretty much in line. Well, besides the Deputy Premier Mike Ellis. But it seems like uh, the uh, Premier Smith has much confidence in Minister Horner in making sure that the financial aspect of the province lays so barely on his shoulders. So, yeah, no pressure, Minister. Wish him luck. <laughs> I, I, I want to talk about another section that because we I mentioned it at the top of the show at the top of the interview, but I want to get uh, sort of going here, and that's around mental health and addiction and public safety. Now, uh, and I'm going to quote here because I, I want to make sure I read this correctly. Uh, Life in Alberta must also be safe. Albertans are done with allowing further deterioration of public safety on our streets, especially in Edmonton and Calgary. They're, they are done with open air drug use and unsafe tent cities and criminals being repeatedly released on bail uh, uh, to reoffend. This is a high order. This is a massive order uh, for this government because uh, with everything else going on in the world right now, there's a lot of concerns that people may just look at uh, open drug use, mental health and addictions being just that, people just being addicted. But there's a lot of things that go into that aspect, whether it be social economics, whether it be just people losing their jobs, people uh, have mental issues in itself and don't get me wrong i i see it firsthand up here in the northeast part of calgary where there is some drugs especially on the trail lines uh this is a main focus for them and i know they made it a priority during the last uh provincial election is it doable though and that's where i'm trying to figure out and that's what i'm trying to ask myself is there's always going to be crime and I don't care who you are. I don't care how you try and spin it. There's always going to be crime. Do you think this is a possible solution? And I know we can get into what some of the solutions that she has outlined, but let's just talk about, can the government accurately fix the addiction problem in Alberta? Ooh. Wow, I'm not, you're not throwing I'm not, softballs today, are you, Chris? No, I, I'm bringing you on full time here, Jen. Come on, you have to come prepared. But honestly, do you, do you honestly, like, yeah. as 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 someone who owns a house in Calgary, and I live in Calgary as well, um, mm -hmm. do you see this as a priority for this government to be able to fix? Because there's so many other things going on in this world right now. I just don't see how putting this on the front burner is going to be a big issue, but I understand it needs mm -hmm. to be addressed. I just don't know yeah. if they can fix it. No, it's a great question. And I, I do think it's on the forefront, you know, when they've, um, when any, well, I just say any municipality, but any polling I've seen that municipalities have done or this government has done priority for the public and citizens is safety right now. So it's, you know, they can't really ignore it to your point. Like they do have to address it. Um, I do also know that this is an area Danielle Smith's interested in, you know, even before she ran for leader, this was a topic she talked about and has very strong opinions on. So um, I do think and it comes from a bit of staff personal as interest. Well, right? Exactly. Chief of staff yeah. is a former uh, person who was addicted to drugs in BC, moved and he's gotten yeah. help and good for him. Yeah, he's got very strong opinions about it, too. So no surprise to see that. I mean, the question of whether they can solve it is, you know, I hope so. I think to circle back to kind of the topic we have to talk about, I think he is going to be working with municipalities on this. It's not a one size fits all situation. I know we've heard um, you've talked to leadership from 
I think it was Paul McLaughlin actually you spoke to who was talking about how this is a huge problem in his community, but it's vastly different. The solutions are vastly different in small towns than they are in somewhere like Calgary. Um, and so I hope if Premier Smith is really taking this seriously, she does work with those local communities and those local leaderships to figure out what they need um, instead of you know pushing forward something that's more ideologically driven. And I, I, I do as well. And that's the big thing that I want to get out of here is this is going to take a collaborative approach. And this 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 seems and I know they use the word ambitious in this uh, in this speech from the throne at the end. It is kind of an ambitious uh, first term, for, uh, first session for this government, especially with a new premier who is relatively new to the role, less than just over a year into the position of premier since winning the uh, election. Um, I know this is just a frame. I know this is just a framework for the government to look at and move forward. Collaboration is going to be key, particularly with the municipalities because it seems like there's not going to be a lot of collaborations with the federal government do you see this as being achievable because you've been you've seen both sides of this you've seen we've seen the alberta ndp come out with speech from the thrones we've seen uh jason kenny come out with speech from the thrones this seems like a very ambitious one particularly when the when you transpose it to what was going on in uh Saskatchewan this is very ambitious because it outlines very strong things that this government wants to accomplish not giving a lot of details and that's the thing that I want to make sure people understand there's not a lot of details in this it's just a lot of plans is it possible to accomplish some of these things in 4 years if they only have one session yeah. where they go through the whole thing yeah definitely i think um you know, a lot of what they're pointing at uh, is provincial government mandate. You know, they are they are staying in their lane. They know um, where they want to do, you know, say what you want about Premier Smith and the UCP. They're very good at sort of choosing their priorities and sticking with it. You know, they set the conversation. They set the channel. They know what's important to them. And um, they, you know, usually kind of plow forward. So I think, you know, if they can use that drive to stick to policy um, and kind of be goal oriented, for sure, it's achievable. Um, but yeah, to your point, it's going to take some collaboration. It's going to take um, a realization that these issues are complex. And, you know, we've heard from municipalities about challenges with things like social services. Um, you know, Daniel Smith's plans for HS are going to have a huge impact on these conversations. You know, what is that going to mean? Um, you know, to our earlier discussion with taxes, if municipalities can't raise revenue, how are they going to be able to provide all these services that are going to be needed to solve these problems? So lots of unanswered questions. But yeah, absolutely. With the right approach and the right collaboration, they can do it. Now, before I let you go, because I'm cautious of time here, I want to just ask because on Friday, the uh, the Friday before the speech from the throne came out from the provincial government, uh, leader of the official opposition, Rachel Notley, and the Alberta NDP released their uh, uh, sort of uh, counter speech from the throne, which is traditional for opposition leaders to do this type of thing where they sort of offer a rebuttal before the speech from the throne is even tabled to say, this is how we would have done it. Um, and a quick glance of this, uh, I know we, I, I, I'm one of those people that does a control search and see if I can find municipalities, see if I can find towns. There's not much mentioned about municipalities here, but it hits on their key platforms. It hits on protecting pensions. It hits on healthcare. It hits on education. It hits on uh, affordability. Uh, this is sort of orange meat for their followers, if you want to use that word. Do you do people care about these type of things? And I'm not trying to be rude about this, but like besides you and I actually sitting down and reading it, which I'm assuming most people have not, would the average person on the side of the street know that the Alberta NDP put out a alternative throne speech? <laughs> Yeah, I had the same thought, Chris, you know, as I saw it, I was kind of like, oh, now I got to read two speeches, like, oh, my goodness, <laughs> some of us have day jobs. But uh, it's it it is, you know, like, yeah, the average person is not reading one third speech, let alone, I mean, it's it's not technically a thrown speech, that's not what a thrown speech is, but I guess they're attempting to sort of get ahead of the messaging and provide their own alternate vision. But yeah, I don't think many people would read that. Rachel Notley also had a really long Twitter thread today where she kind of like repeated a lot of her thoughts. Um so, you know, but that might get a bit more attention. The media picked up on a few stories like that. But, um, you know, I think they have to be careful about seeing too reactive. Um, you know, if everything you're doing is just an opposition to what the government's doing, you lose the message a bit. And, you know, we I mentioned earlier how the UCP is very strong at sticking to their message. And I hope the NDP can remember that it would behoove them to do the same thing instead of being reactive all the time. 
It certainly does. And when I was reading this, it read as a counter. It read as, here's our outline. Here's what we're going to try and hold to, uh, the government to account. Uh, can they do it? Possibly. They do have a slim majority. It's only of a few seats. But I, I don't expect a lot of uh, collaboration between the two parties on a lot of issues. Because it doesn't seem like there's a lot of light between the two. And there's a lot of darkness. But here we are. Um, uh, Jen? Uh, I want to sort of wrap up with this last question. Key takeaway for yourself on this speech from the throne, because I have mine, but for you, what's your key takeaway from this whole uh, day for A, municipalities, or B, just yeah. Albert in general? Yeah, I would say, you know, my key takeaway is this government is very focused on its key priorities, and those are um, mostly involving taking a fight to Ottawa for various policies. So we know what to expect from this government. They're not going to surprise us. This is where their focus is. For municipalities, they're really going to have to fight to get their issues on the agenda. I mean, I think I can't sign off without mentioning the fact that, you know, this year, half the province was on fire. Um, a lot of these municipalities were just stretched to the bone. People's houses were being destroyed, and that mm -hmm. didn't come up once for either, um, you know, this or the government and that if I was a municipality I'd be horrified by that so I hope they take this as a bit of a lesson that they have some advocacy to do um, they've got elections coming up and you know it's under like two years now I guess um, they're gonna have to figure out how to work this messaging in and advocate because otherwise um, their issues are not going to make it to uh, the top of the conversation you you kind of took the words right out of my mouth because I was actually going to mention that as well because oh well, when I was listening to this I was expecting something to come up about these wildfires that has been ravaging and it, to some extent because I I just had Carol Westerland the uh, councillor for Brazo County and she said there are still some uh, big concerns about what's what happened this summer and there's still the aftermath of cleaning up and helping families recover yes there has been programs that the government has come out with but even just two lines a paragraph in the speech from the throne saying that we're going to be with you the entire way it just seemed like it was a forgotten issue and we have our sights now that we've won re-election we've got our sights focused on what's going to happen for the next four years not what happened six months ago which is a sad yeah. reality but i think you're right i think this is an a a, a it is what they promised when they ran for election, re-election in May. They said that this is what they were going to do, and they have followed through on that. And God bless them, because you don't get that often in politics. So, um, Jen, yeah. always a pleasure to sit down with you. We'll do this again. We'll probably be seeing each other probably in February or March or probably before that, because once the end of the session comes around, we'll have you back on to talk about what's going on and what we heard over the last few months when it comes to municipalities at the provincial level. So always a pleasure. Great. I can't wait. Thanks for having me on, Chris. We'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to all of those who have tuned in and watched this episode or are listening to this episode today. Your support means the world to us. Now, remember, our mission is to bring you the most important municipal stories from across Canada, and we can't do that without you. So please, Keep those stories coming. Share your municipal news, concerns, and even triumphs with us. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter to our communities. Your voices are essential, and we're here to amplify them. Now, we will not be having our regularly scheduled municipal affairs rundown on Monday, November 6th. We will, though, have a very special episode dedicated to the newest community in Alberta, Diamond Valley. We will be back on Monday, November 13th with a brand new episode of Municipal Affairs with the biggest municipal news from across Canada and particularly the Rural Municipalities of Alberta Conference, which we will be attending. Until then, stay informed, stay engaged, and just remember, just keep talking.